My name is Ben Grenier. I am a pastor out in southern, western, southern, western Philadelphia. Uh, we are down in Brookhaven, and most people don't know where Brookhaven is, but if you go where New Jersey, Delaware, and Pennsylvania touch, we're about two miles north of there. And so we're down near 95 in Commodore Berry Bridge, if you know where those are. But uh, we're down there and uh, just north of the city of Chester, Pennsylvania. And uh, so I've been pastoring there for seven years, and uh, I'm the lead pastor there at the church. Uh, the church is a revitalization, and we've been working on redoing the church. And the church is called Real Church. And it's not saying everybody else is fake, which is often the joke. Um, but it's saying that uh, God has called us to restore, empower, accept, and love. And so R-E-A-L, restore, empower, accept, and love. And that's what we try to do as a church. Um, I have a wife and three kids. My wife is Jamaican, and I love her. And uh, she's my princess. And uh, I got three beautiful kids, uh, nine, seven, and five, Araya, Katiana, and Xavier. And uh, right now, Katiana is playing a softball game, and I'm missing it. But uh, I know she is going to have some fun and some good stories to tell me when I get home. And uh, so, but it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, hopefully, you got a handout when you came in. If you don't have a handout, just raise your hand. We'll get you another one. Um, but today, we're going to be talking about biblical manhood. And uh, as I was talk, asked to talk about this, this topic, um, one of the thoughts that came in my head was that uh, as we talk about things, you know, our society has created um, manhood. They have defined manhood in a way that maybe isn't biblical. And uh, when we look at culture, when we look at media, when we look at these different things, if we're not careful, we will come to believe lies that are being told to us. We will come to believe things and we will limit what we do because of what we believe. Each of you are chosen to be a man. This wasn't a decision that you made. God made this decision before you were born. The Bible says in your mother's womb, God knew who you were going to be. This was something God called you to do before you were even thought of. God called you to be a man. God chose you. And part of the challenge of being a man in today's culture is that we have to, there's a constant pull to get men not to step up into the role that God asked you to step up into. Today, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you how men have become less of a man because I think that's impossible. Men are men, period. The issue is that men are not stepping up into the role of being a man. The role that the Bible tells us that we should play. And I'm not getting into this idea that saying, hey, you know, you're all a bunch of pansies and you just got a man up. Okay, that's not the Bible. And that's maybe our interpretation of the Bible. That's not the Bible. What the Bible is saying, there is an extra weight on your shoulder. Are you willing to carry it? There is an extra weight to being a man. Are you willing to take on the challenge? Are you willing to be a biblical man? Are you willing to let culture be culture and you say, I'm going to do what I need to do? That's the question today. That's the challenge today. Some of you may know this story. This is a, it's an actual scientific story. There is a flea. There's a man who was, had, a, had a study and he had a whole bunch of fleas. You know, he scratched a lot, I'm joking. But he had some fleas. And what he found out was if he put these fleas in a jar and left them in the jar for a while, the fleas would start to jump. And as they jumped, they would hit the lid of that jar and they would fall back down. You know, and it probably didn't feel great hitting that, that lid. But over time, the flea would just keep jumping and keep hitting his head on the lid. And eventually, he learned not to hit his head. He learned that there was a lid and he couldn't jump past that lid. Because every time he tried to get close to that lid, he would get hurt. Eventually, this man would then open up the jar to see if the flea would jump out. And to his astonishment, the flea would never be able to get out of the jar. Wow. See, before this, 
the flea was able to jump. After this, the flea was conditioned to believe that he could not jump beyond a certain point. My challenge for you today is that there is things in your life, there is culture, and there is things in your environment, there's things that you come to believe that has become your lid. And you have stopped jumping as high as God wants you to. You have stopped jumping because every time you jump, you get hurt. And you come to believe that I can't jump beyond this point. But I want you to believe this today. God is asking you to jump. And it might be higher than you've ever jumped before. And you might be thinking, well, I'm going to hit my head. I'm going to fail. I'm not going to be able to do it. I want to encourage you today. If God put the, the, the job, this, this weight on your shoulder, he is the one who can get the victory if you do what he says. See, this flea learned that he can't get beyond the lid. And for us men... There is times in our life where we have been conditioned to believe that we can't get past a certain point. And these are lids that we need to overcome if we want to be the biblical men that God asks us to be. Today we're going to be looking at the story of Moses. And I know most of you are familiar with the story of Moses. Some of you are familiar with Charlton Heston's Ten Commandments played every Easter, right? Some of you are familiar with the Prince of Egypt. Right, Disney's rendition of Moses. Some of you have read the Bible story. Some of you were in Sunday school classes. Some of you have heard preachers preach about it. Moses is one of those great heroes of the Bible. And even in Jesus' day, Moses was like a superhero to all those who were in that area. Moses was a man who, who, who had some mistakes in his life. He didn't always have all the things going for him. And the first lid sometimes we have to overcome is the lid of our past. We don't run from your past. We let God lead you through that past. Biblical men see that the the past is a tool that God can use to transform you. Your past is a part of God's plan for your life. And you might be here saying, well, how can God use that? How can God use that? Well, let's look at Moses. Moses is what we say. We had, he had one of the best upbringings in the world's eyes. He was skilled. He was educated. He was connected. He was empowered. And yet he killed a man and he had an anger problem. And then after he killed a man, right, the story goes, he ran for his life. And then he found himself out in the desert. He became a shepherd for 40 years. He left everything of his past behind and tried to make a new self for himself. When God had to show up, God showed up in Moses' life. Moses did 40 years in Egypt and he had the power, the prestige, the training. He ruled over people. He was in the Pharaoh's home. He understood a lot of things. Then he made a mistake. He had an anger problem. He ran and then spent 40 years in the desert as a shepherd. Who's 80 years old in here? Anybody, anybody older than 80? Any, anybody? All right. Everybody younger than this guy, there's a hope. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. If God can use an 80-year-old Moses to do something special in a desert, he can use every single one of us. Never think I'm too old to be used by God. Amen? Amen. Because Moses was 120. You're definitely below 120, so you're good there. But Moses was 120 before he died. And he led the nations of Israel through the wilderness. So Moses here, he's a skilled man. He is understand. He's, he's literate. He understands. And then, of course, what we see is that he ran. His past, he, was, he made some mistakes. And, you know, sometimes in our past, if we're not careful, we start to run from it. We fear what God, what's going to happen in, with our past. And if we're not careful with the past, We fear that it's going to take us down. And for Moses, there was this fear of this past that was coming into his life. 
And Moses feared that, uh, you know, for whatever reason, he had to run. He felt like he had to run. And when he ran, he didn't talk to people about it. I don't think he ever went back to Egypt during that 40 years. He abandoned the past. But then he saw one day he comes to a place where there was a burning bush. And, you know, when this burning bush, it says in Exodus chapter 3, Moses had learned this concept of humility. And it says this in verse 10. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you will bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go? Who am I to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, God said, but I will be with you. This shall be a sign to you that I sent you and you have brought the people out of Egypt. You shall serve God on this mountain. First thing Moses does when God tells him he's going to go is try to say, hey, you got the wrong guy. You don't know my past. You don't know what I've done. I've killed a man. I have an anger problem. You can't use me. Are you sure you know who you're talking to, God? Moses here, he's automatically trying to say he's unfit to go. But God reminds him, I chose you, Moses. I chose you. I know your past. I know the past 80 years of your life. I know all the mistakes. I know that you killed a man. I know you have an anger problem. I know you've been living with the sheep and man, you stink. I know that, but I'm still calling you to go. Sometimes our past becomes a stumbling block because we think God doesn't know it. But God wants to use your past as your stepping stone to get you to the place where God wants you to be. He knows your past, but he still chose you. And he's asking you to step up into the role that he's asking you to do. Part of the reason why we have a past is that we are reminded of how gracious our God is. Having a past shows us that we have humility because even though we've made mistakes, we've messed up, God still uses us. It brings humility to our hearts. We recognize this. Part of the reason why God gave us a past is to keep us humble. Keeps us humble. Because when we get to the place where God is using us, the last thing we want to be is in the place of saying, I got myself here. Instead, you look at it and say, look what God can do with a sinner like me. And all of us have that story. I don't know who you are. I don't know your life. I don't know your upbringing. But I know this. We're all sinners. We are saved by grace. And God loves us and chose us to rise to the occasion. The question is, are you going to do it? Are you going to jump past the lid of your past? Or are you going to jump to the lid and stop jumping right there? Is your past your lid? Is your past going to stop you from getting to the place where God wants you to get to? Romans chapter 8 tells us, and we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God. All things, not just your future, but your past as well. Your past is God's way of working in for his glory. Don't run from your past. Let God lead your past. And as he uses your past, he will transform you to the future you. Some of our pasts are not great, but God can use it. Amen? Some of us need to understand that. That God wants to use us. There's a story of a counselor, and he was reflecting on the story of his past. And he, he's newly married, and him and his wife, they were having one of their first arguments as a husband and wife. And now this guy is a counselor. He, he does marriage counseling for a living, and, and he talks to people about marriage and, and conflict and anger and all these things. And him and his wife got in this argument, and his wife says, I am taking a break, time out. Now, as a counselor... That's a form of, 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 it's actually a healthy form of fighting to take a time out. 
And so she goes into the other room and she locks the door. Well, this guy, his anger starts to get developed inside. And he gets furious and he runs after his wife and he goes to open the door and the door is locked and then he starts pounding on the door and then in one fell swoop, he puts his fist through the door. He tells the, the story, he goes, I don't know if she was more stunned or I was more stunned. And at that moment, he realized what he's capable of when he lets his anger get the best of him. After that, after that incident, his wife came out, they resolved the conflict, and they moved on. And then he start, saw the hole in his door it's to his bedroom. And so he got all the supplies to fix the door like men do. We're fixers, right? He got it all ready to fix it. And then as he was about to fix it, he realized something. That God was challenging him not to fix the door. To serve as a reminder. That even the best of us make mistakes. Even people, every one of us can make a mistake. But there's grace. In that mistake. Amen. This served as a reminder to him. And he tells a story that for the rest of the time they lived in that house. He did not fix that door. Because he needed to be reminded. Of his past. And the grace that God gives. Some of you look at your past and you say I just want to forget it. I just want to move on. But your past got you here today. And I'm sure glad you're here. Your past got you into the present situation, and your past is going to bring you to where God is calling you to live. I'm sure glad you're here today. Look at your past as not a stumbling block, but look at it as a stepping stone to let God form a healthy perspective of your path. Then it becomes a lid that we can jump beyond. The next thing is the lid of potential. Woo sorry. The stage not made for big men. I'm sorry. It's creaking and I hope it doesn't fall. No. <laughs> All right. That would be awesome, right? No. <laughs> the lid of potential. Pastor Ben preached and the stage drops. <laughs> All right. Uh, the lid of potential. You know, Moses here is at the burning bush and, and you know, he's talking to God and, and, and he's just trying to say, how can God use me? How can I be used by this? You know, and he started giving every reason in the world to not be used by God. Sometimes I think that God sees more potential in us than we do in ourselves. He sees everything that we are capable of doing, every potential that we have. And a lot of times we have embraced what society has said we're capable of. Or maybe we've embraced the lid of the potential that we think we're able to attain. And so we come to this place, and Moses was in this place that God was saying, I'm sending you to go get them out of Egypt. And Moses says, are you sure you got the right guy? Are you sure that you see that in me? Are you sure that you see the potential in me? A lot of times we live to the point where we are stopped by the, the ideal of what we think we're capable of. But the thing is, when God is working in our life, there is no limit to our potential. Because God is able to take even a guy like Moses Right, And the story goes, and Moses started giving every reason in the world that he can't do it. I can't go back. I can't do this. I can't talk. I can't do this. He was giving God every potential. But God is God. If God knows the future and God is God, right, he knows that we're able to do this. He wouldn't call us to do something if we knew that we weren't able to do it. And so this role of stepping into this role that Moses had to come to this realization is that this lid that was stopping him from getting there to achieving it was a lid he put on himself. Maybe it was a lid culture put on him. Maybe he grew up and his father or his mom or his cousin or his brother says, oh, you can't talk. Don't talk, Moses. You can't speak. Maybe it was Moses telling himself, I can't lead anyone. I get angry. Man, it's hard enough leading sheep. How can I lead people? 
And what we started to see is that Moses started to give God every reason that he couldn't do it. And God gave Moses every reason he can. Sometimes getting past this lid of our potential, what we think we're able to, is realizing God sees more in us than we see in ourselves. He sees what you're capable of doing. He sees your potential. So we overcome this lid by realizing that God gave us every tool that we are needed to achieve this task. What he told Moses was, what is in your hand? For Moses, it was a staff. Shepherd staff. This was a staff that he used to lead sheep. But that staff became so important for Moses. Who gave that staff to Moses? Probably some, probably Jethro or maybe some other person. But it was in his hand. And God says, what is in your hand? Sometimes us realizing our potential is realizing God already gave us the tools we need to succeed. What is in your hands? Some of you are given a Bible, and this is the most potential in the world. It's in your hands. Some of you have a job. Some of you have skills and abilities. Some of you have training. Some of you have an understanding. Some of you have more potential than you are realizing because you think the thing in your hand is not what God is calling you to do. For Moses, he had a shepherd's staff. And God was calling him to do something more. Instead of throwing that shepherd's staff aside, that shepherd's staff became a symbol of his leadership. And in the next story, we see uh, an awesome story of what God was able to do with that staff. There was a story continuing on in Moses. Uh, he was getting, how are we on time? What time are we supposed to go to? 11.15? All right, we got 15, about 20 minutes left. Awesome. Someone give me a warning at like 11.10, okay? Let me know so I know how to wrap it up. All right, lid of capacity or capability. For Moses, oh, sorry, yeah, lid of capability. This is the story of Moses and the Amalekites. Now, of course, jumping ahead, Moses gets out of Egypt with the people and they go into the wilderness. And of course, we know the Ten Commandments and the throwing of the Ten Commandments, right? And all the stories that go along with that. Now we got the story of Moses and the Amalekites. Now, Moses was, this, he was, uh, you know, there was a, a, a nation that came out to fight Moses and all of the people. And so Moses chose Joshua and said, Joshua, you're going to go to the fight. Uh, the Lord told me to go up to the hill and hold up my staff, right? And the story goes that as Moses hold up, held up his staff, as long as he kept it in the air, they were winning the battle. But when his arms grew weary and tired, the staff started to lower. And as it lowered, the Israelites started losing the battle. So then Moses would try to lift it up again, and, and it got heavy. And I don't know about you, but, you know, holding a staff up there doesn't seem like a hard thing to do, but you do it for a whole day, and it starts to get heavy. Some of you, God has put a responsibility on you that you start to feel is a little heavy. You know, maybe when you took on that responsibility, you didn't think it was that heavy. You know, it was light. Oh, that's simple. I could do that. That's not a problem. But over time, that responsibility starts to weigh on you and then you think this, I am not capable of this responsibility. This becomes your lid. Now every time you fail, every time you start to get weary, every time you get, start to get weak, it starts to get heavier and heavier on you. Right? And so what the story goes that Moses, as he was on the top of the mountain holding up the staff, Aaron and her came alongside of Moses and they started to support Moses in holding up this staff. They realized the burden of the responsibility. They realized what Moses maybe was not capable of doing. Instead of letting him fail and the people fail, what did they do? They came alongside of Moses and held up his arms. Story goes that they got rocks and they sat down next to Moses. And for the rest of the day, they held Moses' arms up so he could keep the staff in the air. 
Our culture, our world teaches you that and you got to pick yourself up by your bootstraps. You got to make it. You got to work hard. If it gets hard, you got to be harder, right? And that's what the world tells us. That's what culture tells us. But what we see in the Bible is that you were created in community for community. You were created to be amongst people. You were not meant to do this alone. You were meant to rely on the people around you. And I know that's hard. But we all need Aaron and hers in our life who recognize that the responsibility is heavy and that you might think that you're not capable of holding something up, but they know that you holding that up is going to bring God the glory. Amen? And so they come alongside of you and they hold your arms up. Don't tough up to win. Team up to win. We overcome this lid by teaming up with people, by surrounding ourselves with people of God who can see when we are weak and can help us. But at the same time, we are looking at their life. And when they're weak, instead of criticizing them or condemning them, we come along them and hold up their arms as well. We all need that. That is the lid of capability. You think that you can only, you're only capable of this. Maybe said, I'm not only capable of holding this rod up or this staff up for two hours, but with a theme, you can do it all day. The next one is the, is the lid of responsibility. If you are a man, if you are a husband, if you are a father, if you are a boss, if you are a worker, if you are a community member, if you're a church leader, you have responsibilities. And this responsibility can consume every part of who you are. For some of you, you get to the place where you see that your responsibility becomes what your life is all about. And for Moses, he had the responsibility of judging people. He would sit in a tent And people would come to him with all their problems and they would lay it all out to Moses, say, Moses, so-and-so looked at me wrong and uh, I think they did something wrong, right? And Moses would then have to be the judge. He would say, well, you're wrong, you're right. Well, this person took too much food or this person, uh, they took my donkey, right? He was sitting all day hearing these situations and his responsibility to be the judge. Now, I don't know what happened, but I, I know if Moses is anything like me, you find so much purpose, and you find so much love, and you find so much uh, uh, awesomeness in that responsibility that you go and do that responsibility more and more and more. And soon, you get to the place where you say, hey, sweetie, take your kids, go to the father-in-law, Because, you know, the people really need me. They need me. And I don't have time to make sure our kids are being taken care of. Just go to your father-in-law for a bit. And, uh, you know, when things calm down, I will send word so you can come back and we can handle this. And so the story goes that Moses sends his wife and two kids off to the father-in-law. Now, I don't know about you, but some father-in-laws would love that, but most do would not. (laughs) <laughs> Most father-in-law says, hey, you married her, you're a problem, <laughs> right? Yeah, okay, all right. And so what happens is Jethro comes back to Moses with his wife and two kids. And Jethro is his father-in-law, and Jethro sits down with Moses, and Moses says, man, God is doing some awesome stuff here. And he started saying all the praises of God. God is doing this. He got us out of Egypt. He gave the Ten Commandments. We got this and that. And he was doing all the things and he was praising God. And Jethro was starting to buy into it. He was like, man, God is really using you, Moses. I'm going to give an offering today. And so Jethro gives an offering and makes a sacrifice to God for how awesome God is using Moses. Then the next day comes along and Jethro wakes up and Moses then goes to the seat of being the judge, and the whole day, Moses is being the judge. And Jethro looks at this and says, this is not okay. This is not right. Your responsibility is stopping you from doing everything else that God has called you to. 
Some of us have been called to do things. And because of our responsibilities, and don't get me wrong, responsibilities are great. But we have to have a right priority system when it comes to these responsibilities. You know, being a pastor at a church is awesome. I love it. But I can tell you this, if I wanted to, I could spend every single second of my day and forsake my family, my kids, and even my health so that I'm looked at as a great pastor. How would God look at that? God wouldn't look at that favorably. Why? Because I'm letting one responsibility go over every other responsibility that God has put in my life. Your responsibility, God is calling you to do something more. And sometimes your responsibility has become your lid and you are not going beyond that. Moses and Jethro, this, the story shows that Jethro says, hey, Moses, you, are, you can do, there's other things that you can do. You can find other capable leaders to be judges as well. And what, Moses, what Jethro is saying is, Moses, you're doing too much and you are going to lose your family. You're going to lose your sons. You're going to lose everything. And so Jethro tells Moses and Moses puts these things into practice. And then it says Jethro leaves alone. He leaves the wife and kids. He fixed the priority system. Some of us need to understand that our responsibilities, even though they are good, if they are out of priority, will mess up everything. We got to make sure that we have the right, hum- we got to make sure we have the right priorities as be men of God. We have to make sure that we're putting our God first. And then we got to make sure we're putting our family and then our church, then our country and then our work. We are created to work, but if we put things out of priority, if we put things out of perspective, we become so much about the call that God put on our life and we forget about all the other calls that is also there. The lid of your responsibilities. We overcome this lid by resetting our priorities. And we can get to the place in our life where we realize, man, we're really far from where we need to be. We can really do that. And as a man, I think it's actually a good thing to take some time ever so often, look at your life and say, where am I spending most of my time? Does my time reflect my priorities? Does my life reflect what I think is important? My family's important. How much time of the week am I spending with them? My wife's important. How much of my time am I spending with her? Right? God is important. How much time am I spending with him? Look at your time, you'll see your priorities. Being a biblical man means that we get our priorities in order so that the responsibilities don't overwhelm the things that God has called us to do. Don't forsake your responsibilities, but make sure you put them in the right perspective. The last is a lid of expectations, and I'm going to end with this one. I know we're at the five-minute mark. The lid of expectations. This, this story might have changed my life and maybe have not changed yours after this is done, but this was one of those things that changed the way I look at my life. Moses, when he was coming to the end of his ministry, or end of leading the nation, God was telling him to, to put Joshua in charge. And so he sets Joshua up and he prays over him and he, he anoints him and, the, and then he empowers him I don't know if he took his staff and gave it to Joshua, but in my mind, I want to say he did, even though the Bible doesn't say it. But he gave Joshua the leadership, and then he empowered Joshua to take the people over the river. What's awesome about this is this. Often what we see is a lot of times when we follow somebody... (laughs) When somebody, one of our predecessors, right, somebody who blazed the trail before us, when we take over the reins of leadership, often what we do is we try to copy the person we followed. We try to do what they did. You know, my dad's a pastor and, you know, there's, uh, you know, I always thought about the possibility if I was to take over my dad's church, I always had this, this idea that, man, I could not do what he did. And it almost became this pressure on me. Now, I didn't take over my dad's church. My dad's still pastoring, and I don't plan on taking over my dad's church. But it's this 
thing where when you come into a role, a lot of times you look at the person who is in front of you and you think that, man, people are going to measure me based on how much I'm like them. And so this, this expectations that are put on you can sometimes be a lid on what you're capable of doing. Well, I want to make some changes, but, you know, if I change something, they're not going to be happy. And so it starts to lid what we could possibly do. What Moses did to Joshua is didn't tell Joshua, lead like me. He did not say that to Joshua. What he said was, listen to God. See, Joshua was set up for success because Moses showed him where direction comes from. Your expectations of people around you, your expectations of what people expect you to become is good, but it can become your lid if you don't get, if you're not listening to God for what you should be doing. You might step into a new role at a job and the previous guy did an amazing job and you're trying to copy what he did. I want to encourage you today, that is a lid that's going to stop you from being the person that God called you to be. He is calling you to go beyond that. Don't live up to the expectations of the previous person. Follow what God has for you and do it. How we overcome this This lid is we have to learn to listen to God and to follow him and nobody else. The second is we got to make sure people follow us know to do the same. If you're in a place of leadership, make sure everyone behind you is also listening to God. And make sure the day that you step down, they're not trying to copy you, but they are listening and following what God has for them. Because sometimes as leaders, we put a lid on everyone behind us. And the day that we step out of leadership, all of them are trying to copy us because that's what we taught them instead of encourage them to follow and listening to God. So I want to encourage you today. These are different lids that can happen. And I want to encourage you today. God made you to jump. God made you to jump. And you are far more capable of jumping higher than you ever could imagine. But different things in your life have put a lid on it. Get beyond the lid. Amen. Jump the place where God wants you to be. To be a biblical man means that we have to be humble before God. We have to control ourselves, our desires. We have to protect our family, protect, provide for our family, and lead this family that God has put in our life. And by doing these things, we go beyond the lids of our culture. We go beyond the lids of ourselves that we put ourselves on. And we go beyond the lids of what people expect for us to be. Because God has called you to be his servant. God has called you to live the life that you're called to live. You don't get there by copying anybody. You don't get there by imitating anyone else. You get there by listening to God and God alone. You get there by reading the Bible, putting his word in your heart. You get there by following his voice or shepherd's voice and not listening to your own voice, not listening to culture voices and not listen to anyone else. So I'm going to pray a prayer with each of you today because I want you to understand this concept. Don't let culture put a lid on what you're able to become. Don't put a lid on what you're able to become. But let God use you. Let God transform you and let God grow you into the person you're called to be. Biblical man puts God first in everything they do. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray today for each of the men who are here today. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would show them the lids that they are jumping into And for life, they come to the realization that they can't go beyond that. I pray, Lord, that you would encourage them to jump beyond the lid. That you would allow them to see that the lids that are in their life that's stopping them from going forward is lids that they have placed or culture has placed, but it's not lids that you have put in their life. I pray that they would hear your voice, follow you, and not be held back by the things of this world. 
but allow them to strive toward heaven. Strive to what you've called them to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.